Hi, everybody. David Knorr. I want to welcome you back to another episode of the Curve Benders Live. Uh, I'm delighted you're here. I'm live on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and um, uh, sharing insights from the latest book, Curve Benders, at the intersection of future of work and your strategic relationships. The one behind me, uh, I'm actively writing relationship economics, and that'll be out later this year. Uh, and a lot of people ask, was this something that I you know, thought of through the pandemic, it, it actually takes me about three to four years to read, uh, talk enough, uh, consult, coach, train and develop others around a topic where you finally feel like you have something to say. And I really embark on this journey of research and interviews and and uh, hopefully, you know, intentional time to think about an idea. So I've been thinking about curve benders and, and what will the future of my own work look like for some time? And uh, the pandemic just accelerated a lot of those ideas. So whether it was 15 forces that we identified that will dramatically, that will impactfully create headwind, tailwind, or turbulence in all of our lives. That's the whole chapter two. Or this idea of certain relationships that are going to profoundly accelerate your ability to reach your own journey from now to next. And those relationships I call curve benders. Uh, where are they? Who are they? What do they look like? How do we find more of them? How do we avoid those that will take us in the wrong direction? And I call those fender benders. These are all examples where I'm talking to clients and I'm coaching different teams. And when I see something that is as evergreen across different industries, or geographies, or levels in the organization. You start to believe in this hypothesis that it could be relevant to a much broader audience. And it's just that. It's a hypothesis until you get out and talk about it, until you start to share it, until you start to really reflect on that. And I've always said I learn as much about my own books after they come out because people read them. And they push back and they question and they challenge your assumptions and your assertions. And that's how you learn and grow as a leader, as a thinker, as, a, as a, an advisor, as a coach. So uh, I wanted to really highlight a handful of, I believe, to be important ideas in the book. And certainly the questions I'm getting, the application of these ideas that I'm getting from others. And this is one of them, which is seven steps. I'm going to share my screen. Seven steps uh, to how do you find, how do you meet, how do you identify these curve benders? And, um, you know, the, the question always comes, you know, Nor, if you've got this secret sauce of magical, mystical, where do I find people that can dramatically and impactfully change my life? Just give me the, the, the treasure you know, map or give me the blueprint or the playbook. And regrettably, if you think of the Matrix movie vernacular, there is no blue or red pill. I cannot accelerate your personal and professional growth overnight. What I can do is give you just that, give you a, a roadmap, give you a, a set of practices that not only I've implemented myself, but I've coached others to implement successfully. And this is one of them. So this is, uh, if you've got the book or if you have any interest in the book, it's in chapter three, and I call it Accelerated Relevance. And there are seven steps that I identified in giving you that journey, giving you the path to meet these really strategic, really invaluable relationships that I believe and we're starting to prove can accelerate profoundly, dramatically accelerate your growth. So very quickly, in the last episode, I covered uh, personal foundation. This is fundamentally a, a mindset of what I call nonlinear growth. Just a, a Reader's Digest version. If you think of linear growth, it's like a truck ramp, 45 degrees. I learn, I learn, I learn. Maybe at some point in the future, I'll apply it. And the best example I can think of for that is think of our undergraduate education. Uh, for me, it's been several years, and I don't remember the last time I had to look up differential calculus. It's just not relevant to my world and what I do today. So I don't believe 
that linear growth in our highly dynamic market will suffice moving forward. So then what's the answer? Well, I believe in what I call nonlinear growth, which looks more like a hockey stick. And it's all about how do I identify a problem, quickly learn that solution or potential solution to it, apply it, see if it works, learn the next thing, next thing, apply the next thing to solve the next problem. So I don't need an MIT degree, right? All I want to do is learn how to code. And with a lot of available, free, accessible resources, I can learn the code pretty quickly and solve that problem or find the relationship that can help me do that and solve that problem that then allows me to move on to the next problem and solve the next one. So that learn, apply, figure out what worked and what didn't course correct, learn the next thing, apply the next thing. That's much more of an accelerated and highly relevant learning and growth trajectory. And I call that non-linear, it starts with level one or step one, which is that mindset. And I, in the last episode, I encourage you to go back and watch it. I talked about a growth mindset. I talked about an entrepreneurial one and increasingly a digital one. This episode, I'm going to talk about professional commitment, which is really step two. And this is all about exceeding existing expectations of you. Way too many people I meet are jockeying, thinking about looking at how to you know overcome hurdles for the next job including a lot of wearing their eagerness on their sleeve have you seen what a good job i'm doing i'm doing a fabulous job have i mentioned what a great job i'm doing and what most leaders if they're not thinking it if they're not saying it they're thinking it i just need you heads down focused on being the best you can in the job you have doesn't mean i don't want you to be ambitious doesn't mean I don't value your tenacity. I just want you to exceed existing expectations. Let me say that again. Professional commitment is all about exceeding existing expectations of you in that role, with that role, realm of responsibility, in kind of what you're doing today. Because I believe that will nicely, really nicely set you up for the next several steps. So in the next several episodes, I'm going to talk about catalyst. If you think of a chemical reaction, what creates a catalyst that makes you want to go to step four, which is an immersive inquiry? How do I jump in with both feet to really learn as much as possible? I'm working on a couple of projects right now where, full disclosure, I'm a fish out of water. At certain age, you kind of learn what you do well and what you don't do so well. And what I'm excited about both of these projects, one is for-profit, one is non-profit, is that I'm having a lot of fascinating conversations, a lot of really interesting discussions with some amazing people. And that immersive inquiry is opening my eyes to a whole lot of possibilities. That's what step four is about. Five becomes strategic relationships. How do you connect the dots between the relationships you have and the ones you need to really accelerate your trajectory, accelerate your growth? Six is agile execution. So actually implementing those ideas and perspectives and and uh, you know moving with purpose, moving with clarity of intent on kind of that journey from now to next that you laid out early on. And then seven, this idea of connection cadence coming back to those relationships and keeping them updated. So again, in the next several episodes, we'll talk about those steps. In this one in particular, I want to talk about professional commitment. And if you think about professional commitment, as I said, it really is doubling down on where you are, what you're doing, the impact that you create, the value that you're creating. And Again, I'm incredibly bullish on the next generation. Uh, One of the unfair tags, one of the unfair labels is that millennials want to be CEO tomorrow. I I know several millennials. I've worked with them. I, you know, um, I, I don't think that's true. I think, and it's very dangerous, by the way, to paint an entire generation with a broad brush, right? So they just don't believe in some of the things that that Gen Xers or, or baby boomers do. 
that I need to stay in a company for 20 years to move up and move and be challenged to do other things. So again, I, I'm, I'm, it's amazing how often the, uh, the teacher becomes the student. I've learned from one of an executive I'm coaching. Assume great intent. Assume positive intent. So their intent is to learn and grow. And you hear a lot about this great resignation. I, I was a guest on another podcast and I said, people are not leaving the job. They're leaving, you know, bad managers, bad companies, dysfunctional work environments. That's, that's in essence, what a lot of this great resignation is about. In the last two years of this global pandemic, they figured out they can be really productive working in a much friendly environment. I don't have to put up with the commute. I, I can be around my dogs. I can have lunch with my significant other, my spouse. I can, you know, kind of really integrate what I also wrote about in Curve Vendors, this idea of work-life blending. So why would I go into an office? Why would I move or commute or abandon all the things that are important to me for something that I feel like I have to do to really feel what I want to do? Those are the things that are going through people's minds. And when you have a crappy boss or a, you know, not really a productive work environment, that doesn't lend itself to any of us showing up and, and being at our best. So I really want to delineate this section, the professional commitment to both that which you have control over, your own efforts, and that which you might need others to kind of help you influence, help you create an environment where you can thrive, but you also have a lot of control over that. I'll talk more about that in a second. More importantly, creating a playbook, creating a blueprint for yourself to be at your best, to thrive when you're at your best. And most of us, most certainly leaders I've met, they can definitively identify, and this would be a really good first exercise for you. Sit down, eliminate distractions from your world, and just capture. Capture specific scenarios where you were at your best. What were you doing? What was that environment like? What really worked to propel you, to bolster your success? What, what, were the rocket boosters attached to your shuttle to get you to be at your best. If you've ever played a competitive sport, you know that great coaches, great coaches do that in us. They light a fire in us to hustle when we feel like we're drained, to put in the extra work and really raise the bar in our work ethic at practice. Uh, Waldo Waldman is a uh, former, you know, fighter jet pilot, good friend, motivational, inspirational speaker. He talks about the more you sweat in peace, the less you'll bleed in war. Great coaches do that. Great mentors do that. Great bosses do that. Again, the light of fire within us, not necessarily under us, because I don't believe that will last. So good exercise, sit down, capture, as, as specifically as, as you can, I've always believed specificity conveys credibility. As specifically as you can about the environment where you were at your best, where you were just in the zone, where you were as a sales professional, you were great at sales. As a project manager, your, your projects, your initiatives were on. As a manager, you had the right team and you were doing great work. As a leader, you had a aligned vision and strategy with direction and priorities and focus and the resources. Capture as much of that specificity as possible because it will really come into handy. And I would encourage you to really narrow that list. And let's just keep it simple of, let's say, 10 items. 10 things happened in this environment, environment, this ecosystem, when you were at your best. Once you've got the environment down, because that's, I believe, a little easier to kind of think through, then I want you to make a similar list of what were you doing? What were, your, what were the skills that you applied? What knowledge were you able to gain from the application of that skill, right? What behaviors did you 
prioritize, amplify, implement, kind of showed up with every day that allowed you to be at your best. So again, we're talking about a scenario, a time in your life or your career where you were at your best. I asked you to start with a list of the environment. What were you doing? The work, leader, company, industry, geography, come up with a list of 10 attributes about the ecosystem, about the environment. Then come up with, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Then come up with 10 skills, knowledge, behaviors, things that are absolutely within your control that you were doing in that same environment to be at your best. And, and the reason I like 10 is because what I want you to do is really think about a scorecard. Scorecard about your environment, scorecard about your own efforts. Because when I talk about professional commitment, I believe you need those two. And I'm going to add a third to it in a second. And you can track yourself. How am I doing? When I know that's an exemplary of me being at my best, how am I doing against that scorecard? Am I 2 out of 10 today? Or am I 8 out of 10? Am I 10 out of 10? But where am I today in both that environment as well as my own doing, my own skills, knowledge, behaviors? Those are the three ways I believe we can all create great impact. The third bucket that I want you to think about is really your relationship ecosystem. How were your relationships with your subordinates, if you had any? How were your relationships with your peers? How were your relationships with your superiors? Did you know them well? Did you feel supported? Did you feel heard? If you had objections or pushback or challenges, were they quickly resolved? Did you have the right resources, time, effort, capital from your relationships to do the work? Again, same thing. Come up with a list of relational ecosystem Again, I'm building a scorecard in essence. And all I'm looking at is when I was at my best. So years ago, I worked for a company called Silicon Graphics. We used to sell big Unix-based technology. Great boss. I covered Disney in Orlando as a client. We had great products, highly differentiated. I made President's Club, you know, got engaged in Bali, I mean, just you kind of feel like everything's going for you and you're at your best, you're hustling, you, you know, you're doing well, you're making money, so the economic model works. And if I think about it, that environment, it was just a lot of things came together really well for me. And I was hustling, I was learning, people were pouring training and development into me to continue to learn and grow and so if that was an environment where you're on, you're at your best, you're at that professional excellence, you're, you're exceeding, which is this is really what about expectations of you, existing expectations of you. If you have that picture in mind, if you have definitively those scorecards in mind, where are you today? Where are you today? And what has to happen for you to get back to that environment in what you're doing today. That's really a, a big part of exceeding those expectations is understanding the environment in which you can thrive, understanding environment where you can absolutely set yourself apart from everybody else that brings the same sales or management or operations or accounting or legal skills to the table. If I can build, if I can identify, if I can, to the extent that I have control over, create this ecosystem, create this environment where I can be my best, that's where I'm going to shine. And I don't want you to think about what you don't have as crutches. Well, I don't have that PowerPoint, or I don't have that travel budget, or I don't have that team, or that's not it. It's really understanding where some of those things might be missing and where you should prioritize. So I'm working with several managers and leaders, and I'm reiterating beyond their own skills, knowledge, abilities to contribute, big part of their success is going to come from the teams that they surround themselves with. And you cannot, as a manager, as a leader, you cannot get to the end results you're after with B and C players. 
I've just, maybe it's possible. I, I just, I haven't seen it. So I'm trying to help several leaders score, rank, force rank their teams. Who would you absolutely fight to keep? Right? And, you know, work your way down that list. And towards the bottom is, you know, you never want to lose good people. By the same token, the bottom of that list, people that, you know, probably would be happier, would be more productive somewhere else, would be of greater value to another organization, right? And this is all intended to get these managers and leaders to think about if I'm going to get to where I aspire to get to. And again, I've always called that journey from your now to next. If I want to get to where I aspire to get to, I cannot get there by myself. How do I ensure I'm surrounded with the best possible team and the resources and the focus to heads down, go execute on our set of priorities, heads down, go execute on our strategy and path to get there, right? Set of prioritized pursuits with the, with this kind of dynamic org structure that I have. Some report to me, others do not. Some are teammates, others are not. How do I put the best team on that field? to give us the best possible chance to win, right? That's kind of how I think about it. So in chapter, again, three of the, the Curve Benders book, specific to this step, and again, we're talking about step two of seven of meeting your Curve Benders. You've got to, it's professional commitment. You've got to commit to, I captured seven ideas, seven areas that exceptional professionals, exceptional leaders really commit to mastering. And if you think about mastery, it's intellectual. I'm going to understand as much as I can about that, that environment. It's physical. I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up my best. I'm going to feel good. I'm going to bring energy. I'm going to, right. I'm going to get, I've got plenty of rest. I'm ready to go. It's emotional. My head's in the right place. My heart's in the right place. I'm emotionally here. I, I'm not thinking about my challenges or obstacles or kids or parents or loved ones or, right? I'm emotionally here. And then, you know, this isn't a religious comment, but spiritually. I, I, have, I have faith in myself, in my team, in my organization, in others, in getting us there. And I'm going to let that faith I'm going to control what I can and have faith in a lot of stuff that I can't. That's what I mean by mastery. So intellectual, physical, you physically can't show up. It's very difficult to do a lot of other things. Emotional, spiritual. So mastery in these areas. You ready? Number one, human motivation. If you can learn the science of human motivation, what motivates people to act? What motivates them to learn? What motivates them to take a step? What motivates them to take initiative? What motivates them to show up? That motivation is not a one size fits all. And for you to meet curve vendors, for you to be great at what you do, understanding what motivates other people will become invaluable to you. And way too many managers and leaders I meet aren't as sharp as understanding that motivation as they could be or they should be. So number one, figure out how to master human motivation. That motivation, finding that out, is a huge enabler of creating value in any business, in any business model. That motivation could be by a customer. That motivation could be by a staff or team member. That motivation could be by a channel partner. Less about you, more about what's driving them, what's moving them to work with you, interact with you, build a relationship with you. Number two, master yourself. Mastering your emotions, mastering your self-awareness, consciously, intentionally mastering your behaviors, how to be positive, how to be constructive, how to be inspiring, how to be resilient how to model the right behaviors that you see in others that you believe will help you learn, grow, move forward. Mastering yourself becomes invaluable. So number one was human motivation. Learn how to master 
what motivates others. Number two, master yourself, your actions, your thinking, your behaviors, how you show up on a consistent basis. Number three, inspire through a noble purpose, a purpose, set of values, your personal brand that inspires others, that galvanizes others to do more than just show up. It inspires them to show up and make a difference towards that common mission, common vision, common enemy, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish, and you need others. None of us are on Ireland. island. You need others to help you get there. And if you can inspire through a noble purpose, something that people can believe in, they'll do a heck of a lot more than just show up. They'll actually contribute. They will add value. They'll question and challenge your assumptions. They will help you avoid, right, these massive pitfalls you're headed for because they'll ask a few more questions. This is where you're going to be able to exceed expectations of you if you start mastering these seven things. Number one, human motivation. Number two was master yourself. Number three, inspire through a noble purpose. Four, expand your situational awareness. Some of you know I ride motorcycles. And I taught both my kids. I've taught several friends how to ride. And one of the things that I did with my kids early on was, believe it or not, even after they learned how to ride a bicycle, before we got on the motorcycles, go out on and start riding bicycles on the street. Because the power and the engine and how to maneuver a motorcycle, those will come. But the best motorcycle riders really develop their situational awareness. They really start to realize the pothole in the road in front of me the car at that intersection, the dog that's being walked over there, the branch that's too low, a little further down the street, and the fact that I've got to turn right, and there's also dark clouds over there. That is all just scanning your environment, scanning your situation as input sources that should dictate what you do, how you do it. So similarly, your ability to operate as a conscious leader, your ability to operate, your ability to surround yourself with independent kind of thinkers, your ability to overcome your own bias, your ability to broaden your perspective, your ability to put that all together really builds astute situational awareness. And that will really help you navigate through the good times and the bad. And this is something that takes time. A friend of mine says, um, age is a terrible price to pay for wisdom. And it's true because most of us don't have that situational awareness when we're 20 years old. We don't have that situational awareness in our first jobs or in that internship. Layman's term is we're green or that person is clueless. What they're really talking about is they're not astute in their situational awareness. So if you joined us just, just now, I'm talking about seven steps to meeting curve benders. These are relationships that are going to dramatically, profoundly accelerate your personal professional growth in this journey from now to next. The first step I talked about in the last episode was your personal foundation. In this episode, we're talking about your professional commitment. And that professional commitment is becoming the very best of what you do, the best version of yourself in the job you have today. Not the next job, not I want to be CEO tomorrow, in the job that you have today. And in, in the book, in Curve Bender's book, chapter three, I introduce this idea and I talk about seven aspects of, of our professional lives that if you learn to master, the best people I've ever met, the best people I've ever coached, they master these seven areas. Number one was human motivation. Figure out what motivates other people to move, to make a difference, to contribute. Number two, master yourself. Your thinking, your actions, your language, your behaviors, the way you show up. Master Self-mastery, awareness, and control of your emotions, of what you do, how you do it. Number three, inspire through a noble purpose. Have a purpose for what you do. Move with a purpose. Inspire others to believe in that purpose, believe in that 
direction. It cannot just be transactional. I'm selling a product. Why does it matter? How does it, how are people better off because of what is it that you do? So that noble purpose, number three. Number four, expand your situational awareness. I use the example of riding motorcycles, but it is just as critical for you to understand. Become a conscious professional. Become a, an aware professional of all the things that are happening around you. Surround yourself with independent thinkers and doers who are going to challenge you, challenge your assumptions, why you think a certain way you do. Broaden your perspective, broaden your purview, broaden your horizons. And if you develop that astute situational leadership, you'll start to see further. You start to anticipate more proactively. And that makes you better at your job, makes you better at not just doing the job, but really thinking two, three steps ahead. Number five, bridge your aspiration to impact gap. Bridge your aspiration, here's what I aspire to do, to impact. Here's the results that I'm creating gap. Most of us have that. I aspire to X. Today, I'm doing Y. Where's that gap? Starts by holding yourself and others you work with accountable. I don't see enough of that. I don't see that enough of that in my coaching. I don't see that enough in places where I show up where whole people hold themselves. These are professionals, by the way, very well-paid professionals. Hold themselves and others accountable for consistent action, for consistent results. And this is not about attacking other individuals. To the contrary, I want to attack, I want to challenge. I don't want to attack, I want to challenge ideas, assumptions. Somebody makes a blanket statement. I, I want to know. I'm sorry. Where did that coming from? How did you get there? That's interesting. How did you connect those dots? I want to better understand. And I told another group I was talking to last week, if you don't ask those questions, you're doing yourself a disservice because you don't have now the entire picture. Your mind is sharp enough to fill in the gaps of the picture like a, a jigsaw puzzle. But you don't have the whole picture if you don't ask those clarifying questions. And what better understand, not only holding yourself accountable for that consistent action and, and expected results, what I found out is that you tend to focus on certain things and you tend to accomplish those. Have you seen that? Have you experienced that? I, I sure have. When I make a list of the things I want to get done, it's in front of me and I focus on it. And I work on a daily basis, magically by Friday, I've gotten pretty good at getting most of that list done. So there's this aspiration to impact gap, realize it. What do you aspire to do in the job? Where's the real impact in the job you are creating? Where's that gap? How do you make the best of it? Number six, practice edge leadership. I, I, I'm an old Eagle Scout. You learned this in scouting. It's driven into you. EDGE stands for explain, demonstrate, guide, and enable others to succeed. So EDGE leadership, explain. Here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Here's where we're going. Here's how we're going to get there. Demonstrate. This is all about servant leadership. This is all about the actions, the behaviors you want in others, particularly that next generation, right? Let They're like our kids, sponges. Let them see, let them experience what you do, how you do it. Let them see, let them experience what that executive interaction should look like, how to show up, how to show up consistently. Demonstrate it, guide, guide them doing, just like our kids with riding a bicycle, right? They have the training wheels. Once we took that off, guide them and you can pedal, you can balance. So guide them in their journey. Enable, yeah, enable their success. Remove obstacles, remove friction out of their way. Particularly if you're blessed, and I really do believe it's a blessing to be able to lead others. Your job is to fundamentally remove obstacles out of their way, out of their ability to get things done. So edge leadership is all about 
visionary storytelling, proactive conflict-based learning, right? When people ask you, challenge you, how did you get there? What's that answer? What does that look like? Agile decision-making. You have all the information, make the decision, let's go. Most executives I interview, when I ask them if they have a regret, would you believe it's often we didn't move fast enough? We didn't decide fast enough? We didn't fail fast enough? We didn't learn fast enough? We didn't apply that fast enough? Do not wait for tomorrow something you can do this afternoon. Energizing walking meetings, zero-based budgeting, these all drive growth. They, they cut out frivolous cost. Edge leadership is all about empowering, engaging others, bolstering their success. This is how you become great at your current role and what you're doing. Seven, make exceptional a fundamental organizational DNA. Exceptional. Not, not, not just okay. Not just we'll just get there. Not good enough. Oh, I, that one makes me cringe. Yeah, that'll be good enough. Yeah, that's good enough. We'll just, uh, you know, we don't need a roof on that house. We can just put a tarp over it. That's good enough. I think it's organizational cancer. I think it's, it's, um, I don't, I don't need it to be perfect, but I also don't want it to be average. So when you go after exceptional, when you build exceptional in the organizational DNA, I think you start to attract curve vendors. You start to attract other people who want to know. They start to describe you. That person is the sharpest person I know in this space, in this topic, in that geography, in that arena. And you start to attract when other people ask, hey, who do you know? This happens every day, right? Who do you know that knows this piece or that type of project or that initiative or and the names that come to mind are people who've been exceptional. Nobody, every, every referral is a recommendation. And nobody's going to recommend somebody who's average. Nobody wants to recommend somebody who's mediocre. You never hear, yeah, I want you to work with Joe. Yeah, he's all right. Yeah, Susan, yeah, she, she kind of knows projects enough. Versus, I want you to call Tom. I want you to work with Hector. Juan is exceptional in that piece of the business. Tanisha is unbelievable in that kind of work. So when you make exceptional, fundamental to your personal DNA, fundamental to the team and the organization's DNA, you absolutely set yourself apart. So these have been seven, seven areas that you want to master in yourself, in your organization. Again, a quick recap. Number one is human motivation. Two, master yourself. Three, inspire through a noble purpose. Four, expand your situational awareness. Five, bridge your aspiration to impact gap. Six, practice edge leadership. Seven, make exceptional, fundamental organizational DNA. Those are seven areas that people that I've seen exceed expectations of them, master. So I started that conversation with, Think about a time that you were at your best. What was that ecosystem like? What were you like? How did you show up with your skills, with your knowledge, with your behaviors? What was your relationship ecosystem, your relationships like at that point? If you capture those, if you narrow those down to 10 each, environment, kind of what was I doing? What were my relationships like? I think I'll give you a scorecard of where you are today personally and professionally. And I coach a lot of leaders, and I love to start with that conversation with how's your head, how's your heart? How's your head, how's your focus, how's your intellectual capacity to discern, to learn, to object, to push back, to think? How's your heart? How do you feel? How are you doing emotionally? How are you doing in overcoming obstacles? Resolution comes from within. Right, determining to result to be resolute, to get over obstacles, to get over pains, to get over challenges. Right? How's your head? How's your heart? 
You have to have some sort of barometer, some sort of a baseline to compare that against. I'm two personally. I'm eight professionally. My head is strong. My heart, I hurt. Right? Because of whatever is going on in my life. So you need some sort of a baseline to assess kind of where you are. But if you're going to exceed expectations, and that's the professional commitment in my definition, if you're going to exceed existing expectations of you, if you're going to be the best version of yourself in your current role, the seven areas that are rattled off would be really good for you to master. Again, chapter three of the Curve Vendors book, the seven is specifically listed on page 96. There's a list of them. There's a description of each that I think might be really useful to you. So we're talking about seven steps to meeting curve vendors. This was step two, professional commitment. Come back to the next episode. I'm going to go deeper into catalyst. What does that mean? And, and what I've always believed is you're going to create an awareness of either a limitation, just to give you a glimpse into the next episode, either a limitation, some sort of ceiling you've reached in kind of where you are, or something is missing. There's a spark. Something comes into your life, comes across your radar that says there is a best version of you. There is a higher level for you to achieve. There's that proverbial next step for you to get to. Next episode, we're going to talk a lot about that catalyst. What is it? Where does it come from? What are the most common types of catalysts? How do you, that, if you think of that spark, what is that spark? So if you got the right personal foundation, if you've got the right and a consistent professional commitment to be the best version of what you're doing today, you're going to find that catalyst. You're going to find that spark. You're either going to realize there's a ceiling you've reached or there's a proverbial next step you want to get to. And it could be, I want to change, completely change direction. I want to go in a very different career choice or geography, or I want to pursue. Or, you know what? I just don't want to work that hard anymore. All of those are catalysts. All of those are that spark that you're looking for. And this will lead to curve benders. So I hope this has been useful to you. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, I will repurpose this as an article in the NOR forum community. So I hope you'll join us, norgroup.com slash forum. That's our private online community. We're up to about 3,000 people, like-minded professionals. I hope you'll come and continue the conversation. Uh, I'm there every day. I'm posting. I'm sharing articles. I'm commenting on what other people post. So come join us in the forum. I'll put this as an article there. We'll also, the Curve Benders podcast, uh, wherever you subscribe, wherever you consume podcasts. I try to consistently be on every Tuesday around noon Eastern to share an idea, perspective that might be useful to you. My name is David Knorr. The book is called Curve Benders. It is how strategic relationships can power your nonlinear growth in the future of work. That's what it looks like. Uh, it's available wherever you buy books. And uh, thanks for the gift of your time. Thanks for being here. And I'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. All the best. Bye-bye.